virtually every one of the events. We are really are, are blessed to be here today and to kick off this very monumental day. Uh, the Day of Remembrance and Lament, this marks the 400th year since slavery began in America. And so we're just crying out to God in order to change the trajectory of that story. And then once we build unity, we can go ahead and address other injustices. But we thank you very much for being here. Your involvement and your agreement does really make a difference. Every person, you, you uh, increase the impact of what we are doing by 10%, well, times 10, because the Bible says that one can put a thousand to five, but two can put 10,000. So once we get going at the rate of a trillion, if someone gets something that goes to the bathroom, that knocks us back to 100 billion. <laughs> <laughs> so really the power of unity is incredible. We don't minimize that at all. Um, there's been over 500 pastors and leaders who have been involved with the one race, with the one race movement. And then also today there's about 46 other congregations in the area that are also doing this same day of remembrance. And we do have some guests here that are going to help us officiate in particular. We have Hazel Stevens, who is a co-director for One Race. So. <laughs> Our pastor here, Bishop Garland Hunt, as, as we said, he is in Africa right now, um, ministering, and we, we just kind of see that as a rhythm over the waters mm -hmm. of reconciliation sure. back and forth and, and a bridge and, and God is going to use that um, to get at the root of these things. So we have an international dimension to our, to our mm -hmm. events here. Um, so the mission of One Race is to just really be and operate as a genuine New Testament church that is racially reconciled and one that is positioned, positioned for revival. Um, our current stop on this journey is today in the day of remembrance. So what we're doing today, we want to Set it up so that we can understand the story, the story of uh, the, the travesties of slavery, both past and present. So we want to know that story. We want to own that story. So we're making it our own. We are taking responsibility, not pointing fingers. We're going to own that story. And then also to be able to change the story because future generations are depending on what we're doing. So, um, so Sean and I are going to um, deal with the know the story part. So we have a video for know the story. and doctors, lawyers, and engineers arrived at the U.S. colonies at Jamestown, Virginia on a mercenary vessel named the White Lion. Of the 100 plus men and women and children, only 20 plus of them would survive the voyage to meet the fate of the coming child slaves. This was the tragic introduction of the 400 years of previous racial injustice in America. In that time period, there have been innumerable, lamentable transgressions against people of African descent. Consider, millions were enslaved as chattel. Women were bought up as property, raped, and used to breed more slaves. The deconstruction and selling off of families. Three-fifths of man was enacted, the Homestead Act, Jim Crow laws, redlining, lynching, sharecropping, economic oppression. These abominations of slavery lasted 246 years, stretching over 60% of our history from the year 1619 to 1865, only to be followed by 100 years of the Reconstruction period, segregation, separate the people, and the civil rights movement. Since then, it's only been 54 years living in a post-civil rights period where equality was possible. That's 1965 to present, 2019. This is only 13 and a half percent of our history. Today, we mark the 400th anniversary of slavery being introduced and seek to mourn with those who mourn. That in our collective mourning, we were together to receive the blessedness of comfort. Amen. Glory to God. As Don said, we're doing the know the story part. So we're going to add just a little bit more to the story as we go along. First
first I want to, uh, in 1600, approximately 12.5 Africans were shipped from Africa over to the Americas. And during that time, approximately 2 million of them died on a journey known as a Middle Passage due to unsanitary uh, conditions, overcrowding, beatings, mutilations, what they call discipline on the ship. So millions died on that passage coming from Africa to America in 1600 to 1900. Jumping ahead, then in 1691, Virginia bans all interracial marriage, and the violation violating that resulted in being exiled. And then we had the Civil War in 1860 that was fought where millions, well, many died. And the war went to 1865 where it ended. And the end of the Civil War was also the birth of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. And we also had the convict leasing system that put vast numbers of newly emancipated slaves in prison, and then they were leased out for basically slave labor. Okay, and then after, during the Reconstruction, due to the progressive uh, re, the Reconstruction uh, agenda, right after the Reconstruction, there was a a real push by the Republicans that were in office to right the wrongs. And so they gave a lot of rights to the free slaves, and thousands of slaves were, well, former slaves. Thousands of black Americans were then in political office. We had in 1872 the first American governor that was in Louisiana. It took till 1989, I believe, for us to get the second one. And due to that progressive movement, of Reconstruction, there was a backlash. In 1873, there was a Colfax massacre where thousands of blacks were killed in Louisiana. That was a backlash. They came through, it was almost like a political rally, a political conference. They came through and, and killed thousands of blacks to thwart that uh, move. Okay, and then we have the American Eugenics Society, which was founded in 1913. And eugenics is being like the scientific way of in improving the human race, they say, but by eliminating the unfavored gene pool. In 1922, a white mob destroyed the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where blacks had built up a thriving community. 3,000 homes were burned and 300 people were killed. And in 1932, we have the U.S. Public Health Department conducted the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, and that's where it was an unethical um, study, clinical study on humans uh, regarding syphilis and black people. Okay, well, in 1955, we all know that that was the lynching of Emmett Till, which then sparked the civil rights movement. And then just on a personal note, um, my husband and I were doing some online research into our families, and, and an aunt that came to me and said, um, can you look this up? There's this white person, a great uncle or something, so-and-so, the white man in her family, we don't know where he came from. Can you figure that out? So we looked it up, and it turns out that he was the son of the, the slave master's daughter had a child out of wedlock, and that was the son who he just gave them to my family to raise, and he just raised them, and they just knew him as Uncle So-and-so. Um, um, additional um, data, just some little facts here. Um, the birth rate in, in New York it's so low that blacks are in depopulation there. Um, the Af African Americans are incarcerated in s state prisons at more than five times the rate of whites. And median household income of whites in 2017 was 61,372 and only 40,340 for blacks. Mm. So what part does religion play in office? I don't have time to get into what the Bible actually does allow regarding slavery and how American slavery does and does not fit that paradigm. And it's, in some ways, members of the church brought comfort and healing and risked their own lives to fight against the brutality of slavery. But in other ways, some people uh, made the problem even worse. Some people twisted scripture to make, to make an argument that blacks were inferior. Some churches invested in slave ships and had slaves. Some masters were, would teach just enough of the Bible so that the, the slave would feel the need to be obedient but not teach them enough so that they would recognize the disobedience of the master. And there's even a version of the Bible for slaves where it takes out the story of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt so that the black people wouldn't get any ideas and try to do the same. Um, so, um, so 
So as time went on, some churches would be silent during the civil rights time and even hold on to segregation. So as New Testament believers, we have to consider the essence of the third commandment as it relates to slavery. So the, the commandment says that thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold the guiltless that take his name in vain. So this is, this is more than just um, cursing using the Lord's name in vain. We have to consider also that um, in this case, it also means that, that we as Christians should not take or carry or bear the name of God and then do evil. All right, it damages the reputation of, of God in other people's eyes. So even though the world is never going to understand completely what the believer is doing, such as spiritually discerned, we, we do understand and do lament what the church, the disrepute that was brought to God's name from the church. And so we do indeed need to be sure to be discerning and to resist that type of behavior as we deal with issues of our current day. And then uh, now we're going to take a step higher and we're going to read the story from a biblical world, world viewpoint. So once upon a time, the devil conceived a, a plan to steal, kill, and destroy one group of people through enslavement and another group of people through greed and pride. So we know that the devil, the devil had no favorites as far as the race. He hates all alike, black, white, you know, uh, whether it's white privilege or black pride, the thieves come what? To steal, to kill, and destroy. So we have to be careful in our pursuit of justice that we don't actually elevate race to a higher level. Yes. Amen. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Cursed is the man who trusted in man make his flesh his own, his strength, and whose heart departed from the Lord. Towards the end of the of our 400 year history, uh, we made some gains. Civil rights gains, jobs, first black president, a measure of dignity and uh, prosperity has been gained now. Still, the enemy crept in unawares despite these gains, a certain vestige of slavery emerged. It's a system of to exterminate people by means of birth control and abortion as genocide. And of course, compassion and care and concern, and certainly God has redemption for people who have been caught in that system, but the system itself of reducing the number of people and exterminating people is very grievous. Margaret Sanger, the founder of the American Birth Control League, reveals the inspiration for her work in these words. We are paying for and even submitting to the dictates of an ever-increasing, unceasingly spawning class of human beings who never should have been born. Mm. This was just the fruit of a eugenic root that had been planted back in 1857 when Francis Galton brought eugenics to America to solve the Negro problem. Then the idea was fertilized in 1859 when, with the release of Darwin's book on the origin of species, whose often neglected subtitle was Preservation of Favored Races and the Struggle for Life. So today, 52% of all black pregnancies in the United States get abortion. So that means, as one um, preacher put it, the most dangerous place for an African American is in the womb. That's why um, we've lost you know, 20, million, 20 million precious babies since uh, abortion was legalized in 1973. And that calculates to an appalling rate of 1,000 786 abortions per day. Mm. Uh, and I like to just even reiterate that. Of births in the African American community, 52% in the abortion. A dangerous place to be. The safest place that there should be is in the womb. All of these are results of the history, the degradation, the, the self degradation that has occurred. All of it was a, the plan of the enemy to destroy, kill, steal, and destroy uh, the race of God. Now, we know that the Bible says that the wisdom of this world is foolishness unto God. So in the eyes of heaven, pride goes before what? Destruction. And a haughty look before the fall. And he says also in Proverbs, Give me not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. So white supremacy, black pride, self-centeredness, self-indulgence, all are the ways down and the tricks of the enemy to destroy us. Paul says,
says in Philippians, what things were gained to me, those things I counted lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. So during the dark years in America, history, all the injustice, the abuse, the shame, in the eyes of God has positioned the oppressed to be the chosen of God. In 1 Corinthians 1.26, he said, not many noble, not many mighty are called. But God has chosen the foolish things, the weak things, the base things, the things which are despised. God has done what? He's chosen those things. Why? He said that no flesh should glory in his presence. So even in this, in what seemingly was a, a, a curse coming from Africa, God said, no, I've chosen the weak things, the, the ones out of nothing, the things that have been despised, the things that have been debased, that have been stepped on. God said, no, I, that's what I choose, to confound the wise. So that no flesh should glory in my presence. When, I, when it happens, when I raise you up, that I'll get all the glory. So my race, my intellect, job, ability, all must be lost and laid at the altar in order for me to do what? To gain Christ. We're looking the view from heaven of these 400 years. So when facing the toxic history that we're looking back on and the to toxic atmosphere that we may see, we have to do what we must be so that he can increase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ephesians 6, 12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Yeah. So we understand that it is a, a spiritual battle. Yeah. If I'm looking at race, and I'm looking at what? Flesh and blood. Yeah. But there's another enemy. And Solomon then also saw the oppression of his days in Ecclesiastes 4, 1. I'm going to read that for you. And he began to speak of the oppression that he saw. He said, so I returned and I considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comfort. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power, and they had no comfort. John 10.10 10 said, the thief come not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. Jesus said what? I have come that they might have life, that they might have a more abundantly. Although the power is on the oppression, Jesus said what? I have come that you might have life. In Romans he says, but when we were yet without strength, when we had nothing left in us, he said at that time, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So we know in this story, the answer to all the abuse, the race question, pride, the oppression is the blood of Jesus. He's broken down by his own blood the middle wall that was between us. He's reconciled, the Bible says, all things that are in heaven and in the earth by his blood. We who were once afar off, both the oppressed and the oppressors, are made nigh. We're brought together by the blood of Jesus. So lastly, I want to speak of Nehemiah, and that's in Nehemiah chapter 1. When he heard the story of his countrymen, he asked his friend to tell him the state of the children of Israel that was in captivity and left in Jerusalem. He began to tell them. When he heard the story, he said that his friend told him, they're in great affliction. The children of Israel that's back from the exile that was left after Israel was taken captive to Babylon. The ones that are left, he said, they're in great affliction. They're despised. Their houses and their gates that are ruined. They're burned. And Nehemiah heard that story. And when he heard the story, he, he first identified them. The Bible said we are the mourn to those that are that mourn. We are the weak to those that are so the first thing he did, he heard, we've heard the story. We've seen the story. And so the first thing Nehemiah did was he identified with the story. The Bible said Nehemiah wept when he heard what was going on in his country. He said Nehemiah mourned when he heard what was going on with his country. And then he confessed, not Lord come and, and destroy them. He confessed that Lord, we have seen in this story. Is, we were all of our own. We own the story. We say, Lord, in this oppression, we have sinned. He owned the story. He said, he is 
evolved from 1619 for the first slaves coming on white line to 2019, 400 years in America, the degradation, the abuse, the oppressor, and the oppressed. And let us all say, just in hearing this, that we now will know the story. Let's know the story. Let's have a say loud on that. Let's take this moment of time to reflect on the story of these four years.
after 400 years of prophetic silence, God sent his messenger, John the Baptist, to prepare the way for the salvation of all men. As we come upon the 400 year mark since enslaved African people were first brought to the American colonies, our hearts are alert that God is on the way. And perhaps this is the moment for a radical movement of justice and revival in our nation. And in the awareness that God is moving, we must recognize we all have a part to play. Consider Daniel. It was upon observing the decades of captivity noted in the book of Jeremiah and the realization that those times were fulfilled that Daniel was prompted to cry out in intercession. Daniel recognized his moment and he seized it to own the sword. In his prayer, Daniel declared the sins of his people and made requests for God's mercy and deliverance. Lord, you are righteous, he cried out, but this day to us belongs shame and face. To our kings and our princes and our ancestors, we are covered with shame because God we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God, to him belongs mercy and forgiveness that we have rebelled against him. All Israel has transgressed the law and turned away, refusing to obey you. But Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act for your sake, my God. Do not delay. To offer this prayer, David was fulfilling what God had asked his people to do in 2 Chronicles 7 14. He promises, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, turning from their wicked ways, God says, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Amen. So that's what we're believing for today. And I'm going to share briefly in my heart to own the story, why it's so important for us to enter into the story that was just shared spiritually before a holy God. And my preaching and exhortation today, briefly, four or five minutes, is intended to, well, you watch out for a preacher that tells you four or five minutes, right? Yeah. But I'll do my best. Is to set us up for a moment where we can come to this altar and say, God, we believe the truth that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray that you're going to hear from heaven and forgive our sin and heal our land. Because it's in that moment more than anything we say to each other today out of a place of revelation, what we say to God matters most. I want to give you just a little bit of context in my own story and why I'm standing here sharing with you guys today. Over three and a half years ago, at your other location before you moved to this church, I sat in a meeting with Bishop Garland Hunt, Billy Humphrey, Scott and Tammy Free, another uh, couple named Corey and um, Jay Lee, and we sat there together and in a time of fellowship discussed the racial division that was already rife in our culture and our land at that time. It was directly before the summer of 2016, and little did we know how that fracturing would deepen uh, to the degree that is present in our culture and society today. But we know the remedy for a diseased nation is a healed and healthy church, right? And the remedy for a divided nation is a united church. And so we began this journey of one race that has brought us through 40 prayer meetings, gathering churches together all across the city of Atlanta, up to Stone Mountain, where we stood where the Klan had erected a cross a year ago today and burned a cross publicly for the very first time in 1915. And we went there 55 years from Dr. King to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech where he said the sons of former slaves would sit down together at the table of brotherhood with the sons of former slave owners. And we did that. But literally the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners broke bread in reconciliation around the table of the Lord at Stone Mountain on the Red Hills of Georgia. And it says also in that speech that from the top of Stone Mountain let freedom ring. And we erected a cross that was draped in crimson white, led by 500 pastors, and we did that a year ago today, and I believe on that day we addressed the spiritual powers of the atmosphere, and we said a united church is the purpose of God in this city, and every place of division and every spirit of division must stop its attack upon the church and its attack upon the culture, and I believe a gate that was opened by a pastor who led that group of Klansmen in 1915, a spiritual gate, was closed over our city. Amen. Right? But when the heavens are shaken, Right? And the atmosphere begins to change. How many of you know also the human heart that needs to be in the right? And so we went on this year-long journey to take people into understanding of where have we been historically, what has been the complicity of the church with that, and how can we own that like Daniel did. And I love the prayer of Daniel 9. It's been a theme of mine for, for over this year. You just heard it in the video clip. It's incredible because Daniel, we know, when they sought to bring accusation against him, what was it his enemies said? 
Nothing of fault can be found with this man. And yet when he prays, he said, Oh God, to us belongs shame of face. Right? He didn't say to them belong shame of face. When Nehemiah prayed and Ezra prayed and these men and women of righteousness stood in the place of intercession, they didn't say, Oh God, help the sinners in the land. Right? They said, Oh God, to us, to our people, to our family, they made it personal. My family is here with me today. We've been fasting these 21 days together. My kids are eight, four, uh, three, and two, okay? So you guys, we can have a moment of prayer for us. <laughs> but they didn't do any eats or sweets over the last three weeks. And they did a great job. And so, but they understood we were praying for America. It, it took my four-year-old a little while to realize we actually lived in America. That was the first <laughs> week of passing for about, about four or five days in the for America. She said, we live in America. <laughs> said, yeah, we live in America. Right? But she's learning. That, that's the first step to learning that we have to own the story, right? Is that we are all Americans, right? Not white Americans, black Americans. And we are all the church, right? And so the sins of the church are our collective sins to take responsibility for in our generation, Right? I want to read something from Frederick Douglass. It was one of the most provoking quotes during this season. It was the third or fourth devotion during our fast, and it stirred me because I said, this is the legacy of the church. And it's easy for us to look back on the mistakes of the past and say, oh, th those people, right? But when God sees us, he sees the generations that have gone before us, and he sees the, the iniquity of, of the land. And he wants this generation to take responsibility before that, though we may not be the responsible person individually, though I may not have ever owned slaves, or maybe my family never owned slaves, maybe I'm actually the, the child of the forefather, uh, 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 generationally, of someone who was a slave, right? Or maybe my parents were abolitionists, maybe there's a checkered past of both righteousness and unrighteousness. But God is looking, his eyes are going to and fro throughout the earth, looking for ones whose hearts are loyal to him to take responsibility for the iniquity of the past and say, in our generation, we're going to own it and we're going to change it. Yeah, that's good. And this is the quote from Frederick Douglass that Purdue, uh, the abolitionist in order that provoked me so deeply. He said, the slave auctioner's bell and the church going bell chime in with one another. And the bitter cries of the heartbroken slave are drowned in the religious shouts of its pious master. Revivals of religion and revivals in the slave trade go hand in hand together. The slave prison and the church stand near each other. The clanking of fetters and the rattling of chains in the prison and the pious psalms and the solemn prayers in the church may be heard at the same time. The dealers and the bodies of men erect their, uh, erect their stand in the presence of the pulpit and they mutually help each other. The dealer gives his blood-stained gold to support the pulpit, and the pulpit in return covers his infernal business with the garb of Christianity. Here we have religion and robbery, the allies of each other, devils dressed in angels' robes, and hell presenting the semblance of paradise. And I wrote, As we endeavor to know the story and change it of our nation's marred racial past and the church's marred racial past, we must remember to lament our historic complicity and reflect on the hypocrisy but as we do that, let us consider where are the places that the church continues in false piety and dead religion? Where are the places where we have stood erect in pride and said that is not my problem to own? It's easy to condemn slave owners who profess to be Christians, but we must reflect ourselves and ask, does that same racial animus animate our actions today? And I say that obviously as a white man, to a majority uh, African-American congregation today. I want to say to you, I'm here to own my part in the story. Yes, sir. I'm here to say before a holy God and before you, I am sorry for the way I and my, my spiritual forefathers and my natural forefathers have participated in a system of racial injustice, slavery, Jim Crow, separate but equal. The history that we laid out that has brought us to this present day, we're still whether it be in synagogues or whether it be in Walmarts in El Paso, there continue to be racially motivated acts of crime against minorities in this nation. And I believe that if we want to end that violence, the church has to take its place of authority and say that sin is present because perhaps we never own what we've done wrong. Hmm. And so I want to invite you to stand with me today. And let's go in a moment of prayer. I'm going to invite my wife to come.
I believe that's in a corporate prayer of repentance that we can say together that will allow us to own this story. There is power in confession. The Bible says when we confess our sins to one another, we do so that we may be healed. I believe it's similarly true today that as we confess the sins of our nation one to another and before a holy God in his presence, like Daniel did. He said, oh God, to, to me, to my fathers and to my kings, to, uh, on behalf of my governmental officials, to us belong shame of faith. But the beautiful thing, the very next, it's a comma. If you read it in your Bible, it's a comma. It says, but to you, oh God, belongs mercy and forgiveness. We come with shame of faith because on the other side of our humiliation is God's lifting us up. And if we will confess our sins, God says he will heal us and he will lift us up. Would you lead us again? God, we are sorry for the sins of our nation, of racism, hatred, bigotry, prejudice, and its lasting legacy of injustice. Our previous generations have transgressed, and we have transgressed by dishonoring and dehumanizing your image and our brothers and sisters. For those who have been wronged in their person and in their generations, Give them grace to heal, forgive, and grant them restoration, God. Forgive us for our sins of commission where we have agreed with racism, and omission where we have been silent and complacent in the face of injustice. Cleanse our hearts, God, of all attitudes that displease you. Cleanse our hands of all actions that dishonor you, and make us worthy of bearing your name in the world. Your church, one holy family for our Heavenly Father. Grant us grace to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly before you. In Jesus' name. What we're going to do now is we want to just have a time of energy and prayer together. We want to actually invite people to come into the altar. And let's let a corporate cry of lamentation arise before our God right now. We're going to invite several leaders to come up and to pray. And we're going to seek to open the story. And say, God, hear our cry today. We just prayed this corporate confession. We said, God, we're sorry for our sins, the sins of our fathers, the sins of our nation. Lord, would you see us today? Your people call by your name. And here we are, God. Your people call by your name. Humbling ourselves, God. Seeking your face, oh God. Would you hear from heaven as we turn from our sins? Would you come and heal our land? As we get a cry out There's no new sins in this world. It's just building people sin. But we're going to pray. We come, we want to pray corporately. Because I believe when you, when you pray corporately, you break up the atmosphere of the devil. Now I want you to have your own heart. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity.
direction that I pray and prayer and dedication of ourselves to this moment right now. It says in Ezekiel chapter 9 that the, the angel of the Lord put a mark on the forehead of all of those that wept and cried out over the abomination that were in the land. And I'm just going to ask God right now for a marking, a setting apart of each and every person here for the ministry of reconciliation. And even as we were singing the song of God's delivering power, the power of deliverance that comes in the name of Jesus, I feel like the Lord said to commission you with Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4. So I'm going to pray that over you right now. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me and upon you because he has anointed us. And we place our hands upon ourselves. And we ask, Father, for a divine transfer of your anointing in this moment. To preach the gospel to those in need. For the opening of the eyes of those both spiritually and naturally blind. That the lame, those who have no strength to stand, would stand by the power of the authority of Jesus' name. And that those who are held in captivity to racism, Bitterness, unforgiveness, pride, white supremacy, black pride, whatever manner of divisive belief or ideology, that we would be those that can reconcile them to God and to one another. So we receive today, and just speak these words out of your mouth if you will. We receive today the ministry of reconciliation and the spirit of the sovereign Lord. That the captive would go free. Use me. Use my mouth. Use my hands. Use my feet. To reconcile men to God. And women to God. And to one another. In Jesus' name. Amen. This is how we change the story. 
In Micah 6, 8, the prophet says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk on you with God. We charge you today to take up your part in changing the story. Refuse to be complacent in the face of injustice and be the change one conversation, one interaction, one life at a time. Ultimately, we know the end of the story. One day, we will experience perfect unity as people from every nation, tongue, and tribe, worshiping our God and Savior around the heavenly throne. But let's not wait to taste heaven's realities. Let's bring that love, justice, beauty, and worship in every place God sends us. Así que te bendiga. Dios te bendiga. Dios haga resplandecer su rostro sobre ti y te dé paz. Amen. Wasn't that beautiful? Wow, the question of how do we change this story? Do you think today we are on the way? Yeah. You guys, this has been amazing. I think we're all on the way to changing the story. And um, just even reflecting on what we've done today, you know, owned in the story and owning the story and how, how do we change this story? It's a lot. It is. It's a lot. Even as we prepared and thought through this, you know, we said, wow, this is a lot to think about what to do. And guess what? In our own minds, we really can't figure it out. So we cry out. We look to Jesus, the balm in Gilead. Because yeah. the wounds of spiritual, physical, emotional, they're so deep. But we can kind of find comfort in knowing there is a bomb. There is a bomb in Gilead. And actually, as I did some research, I was like looking for the scripture. I was like, where is this scripture? And what I found is that is an old Negro spiritual that actually pulls off of an Old Testament and New Testament place. And it talks about Jesus being the one who heals all the wounds of the past in the African American community. And I thought, that was just so beautiful because we do face a lot of challenges in our community. And I thought about our Lord, you know, and Savior as the mom, and he really endured everything we do. I mean, as African Americans, you gotta think about this. He was born to the son of a Jewish carpenter. He was born economically disadvantaged in poverty. He he, he had to have like a baby daddy. I mean, if you really think about it, I'm like, wow, Lord. You know, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> it's nothing that, you know, we go through that you have not born from us. Yeah, so right. there is a beauty that even if he, you know, can live through those things and redeem those things, my goodness, he can redeem our mess. Absolutely. And I think sometimes, Katrina, we get caught up in the ugliness of the healing process because it's not pretty, it's not comfortable. And I think we get angry and sometimes we get resentful in that healing process. Uh, and I believe America is in a state that we are in that healing process. But one thing I do know as we come together today, that it begins with us. It begins with the church. And uh, as I was looking, I was looking at um, God's system or God's method of reconciliation, which is forgiveness and repentance. Yeah. Anytime forgiveness meets repentance, you will have reconciliation. Yeah. And in any relationship, whether it's with your wife, whether it's with a friend, whether it's uh, with a co-worker, anytime you meet forgiveness meets repentance, you'll have reconciliation. Yeah. And so that's what we need today as people who walk in that. Not people, I think we've learned how to uh, kind of perform and act like we love, but it's time for people of God to walk in love and walk yeah. in repentance and walk in forgiveness. Yeah. And Katrina, I know a scripture we often use, um, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and I talked about this on Thursday, and it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, and seek his face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive them and hear their land. Yes. So what God is asking is, is my, if his people will humble themselves, yes. if they will pray, yes. seek his face, that means consistently seeking God until yes. we see him. Yes. 
Amen. And then they will turn from their wicked ways. This is uh, four ingredients uh, to the the the, uh, uh, the, the, the for you to win the cake of repentance. You understand? So this is not. Uh, oftentimes we'll use this scripture uh, as a corporate uh, time to uh, pray and ask God to heal for our land. But this is God really saying, "I want personal, individual revival with each and every one of you." Yeah. So you have to read the scripture, take this person, yeah. not necessarily bring everybody together, because you got to remember God was talking to one person. He went to He went to one person, which is Solomon, and said, "Look." If you will humble yourself, if you will seek my face, if you will pray, if you will become revived, then guess what? Others will catch that fire. And that's what God is saying. He said, for each and every one of us, because our corporate revival cannot happen unless somebody is personally revived. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody has to be personally revived. So if your closet is empty, your corporate, your corporate prayer is not powerful. Somebody has to say, I'm going to wake up like Jesus the great rock before day and seek the face of the Lord. Somebody has to say that I'm going to really pray. I'm not going to just pray on my way to work. I'm not just going to pray anytime somebody needs something, but I'm going to live a lifestyle of this. A lifestyle of this. A lifestyle. If someone is living in repentance and walking in forgiveness, then you always have reconciliation. If you leave it at the altar and you think surrender is just coming into the altar and you leave it there and you don't walk out that surrender, you're not a surrendered person. You just had a moment. You just was emotional for the moment. Yeah. But somebody has to walk that out in everyday life. Yeah. That's when change will happen. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. One more scripture I wanted to read, which is um, Matthew 3 and 8. Matthew 3 and 8. And so John, they came to, uh, to John and uh, they asked him, what, what should we do? And John said to them in verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, what fruit do you have that says that you have turned your life over to God? What, 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 what have you produced that says God really has your heart? That you really come to a place of repentance? What's following you? What are you producing that says that? That's the change God is asking for, is that you would produce fruit in keeping of repentance. In other words, are you keeping your repentance at a level that someone else is coming to repentance? Somebody said, I gotta have a fire. Come on, I gotta have a fire. Set in me so that I can set a fire. It's somebody else. That's what God is there for. And the change that God is there for. Absolutely. Thank you, Sam and Marvin. We want to get that down. Amen. Amen. Come on, we do this Repeat after me. God set a fire in me. God set a fire in me. That I can set a fire.
Hallelujah. We're just going to worship the Lord. Hallelujah. We serve the mighty God.
last year with hundreds of pastors, thousands of believers at One Race Stone Mountain, and we continue to present it in environments. It's a commitment to stand against racism in every form, to stand for justice, to speak the truth, and that is one of our important calls to action today, to understand what One Race Movement is about, to commit to, in our individual spheres, going out and being the change we want to see. Amen. So we are not going to take time for us to read and sign it in the service, but what I encourage you to do if you haven't signed it before is text that number, get in your phone, leave it unmarked, and then when you get home, when you have a quiet moment this evening, you put the kids down for bed. That's what I, that's what I think, to go back and check the messages from the day or go back and read the notification and, uh, and go ahead and go in there, read the Atlantic Covenant and sign it for us. Amen. And then Pastor David, you're going to come up and share with us. We're going to go into communion, a moment of communion, around the body and blood of our Lord together. It's been awesome. We have yeah. had an awesome time of praise and worship. We're going to get ready for communion. We're going to, we're going to do communion together, amen? So we just, uh, can you guys bring it up and get ready to pass this out? We serve such an awesome God, and we got to remember who we are in Christ. Remember the, the power that we possess and the authority that we have. And, and know that God always has our back. He really does. Amen. And so there has to be a spirit of boldness that, that come across us. Uh, it was said earlier that the most segregated time, uh, day of the, of the week is on Sundays. That's how, that has to change. When God talks about the church.